Okay, we'll open prayer because I need it. <laughs> Lord, thank you so much for uh, what you give us in beautiful weather. And uh, Lord, spring is, you know, it's it's uh, such a nice time of year to see everything bloom up and it reminds us of life. And Lord, we look forward to newness in life in you and uh, eternal life forever in uh, new heaven and new earth and all the things you have planned. And God, uh, it's a bittersweet thing because we know that the world must continue to decline and get much worse before it gets better, just as uh, John had to discover and just as the uh, angel had to communicate with him with the scroll you know, that, that he had to eat. And God, that's kind of our, our bitter pill that we have, um, and it's bittersweet, yeah, even now. And Lord, give us insight into your word. Give us wisdom. Help us to comprehend your word better and better as time goes on, Lord. And uh, we'll be so careful to thank you and to praise you for all of our comprehension and wisdom that we learn. In Christ's name, amen. All right, well, so where we left off last time uh, was chapter 10. And um, were there any questions about chapter 10 before we go on? I don't know what that was about. It was John before the angel and... I don't know if we left anything unanswered from last time, but, but before we go on, I want to make sure. I mean, there's a lot of questions. We, one of the things we see in um, this whole thing with the seven thunders is we see some similar scenes, right? So we've got um, the seven thunders of the seven sayings in Daniel chapter 8. And that is the seven sayings. The scenery is very similar when you look at Daniel chapter 12, except you don't hear the thunders, you don't hear the sayings, but the setting is very similar as Daniel chapter 8, but especially similar to what we have in Revelation 12 with the angel and the rainbow and the clouds, one foot on the land, one foot on the sea. So when you get into Daniel, Daniel chapters 8 all the way out through chapter 12 is all about uh, reaching this focal point in history where we're looking at right here. Where we're, we're moving into the great tribulation or uh, the great and terrible day of the Lord, all these different terms we have. And again, about that, we know from Daniel chapter 9 that there's this... Uh, 70th week of Daniel. We've got the 69 weeks, and then we got the 70th week, and it's all about Israel again. And we've got history has been interrupted with this time of the Gentiles, this uh, time for the church for the last, you know, roughly a couple thousand years. So, <clears throat> yes, the entire 70th week is all about Israel and God restoring Israel, getting that process and redeeming them and salvation and those kinds of things. But really the focal point, as Jesus pointed out in Matthew 24, the abomination of desolation and all these different terms, we know that the last three and a half weeks, the second half, once the Antichrist beast, when he's been killed and he gets possessed by Satan and Satan's kicked out, um, that's when... Um, all kinds of wrath from Satan starts happening, right? But it's also wrath of God. Um, so let's let's see here. Let me let me flip to this again real quick. So just by way of review, I have slightly nudged and slid a couple things around on here a little bit, just because um, the the chapters that are in parentheses here are, um, they are the, the parentheticals. Let me get this to open up here. They are the parenthetical chapters, but here's the thing is that some of them kind of start off in parentheses if it goes to the past and then catches us up to current. Sometimes there'll be a chapter that 
is starts off in, in, in the relatively current time frame, but then it finishes off at the second coming all the way out, or even, you know, the millennium. Um, let's see if I can get this to go here. There we go. Get that to open up just because. Um, so, so we, we've, we've been in a parenthetical and we get into chapter 11 and chapter 11 is a big parenthetical as well, because we're going to look at the two witnesses, really this whole period, uh, in this chapter is about, um, the beginning of the tribulation period and it catches us up to the death, the murder of the two witnesses here in the middle. A lot of great Bible teachers will disagree. And yeah, if you could hand, we have handouts. Thank you, Hillary. We have handouts. Um, so whoever ends up hearing online and other people who are gone and listen to this day, they're going to say, oh no, the handouts. But you can email me or show up next week and I'll give them to you. Let me know. I'll make sure you get them. But uh, it's just kind of an, an overview, um, just kind of looking at the woes in chapter 10 up through chapter 16. And the reason why is because Revelation gets kind of, um, it's kind of a mix, it's kind of a mishmash of everything come, getting up to speed with the great and terrible day of the Lord right here in the middle of the tribulation, right in the middle of the week. So trying to get the stage set get the setting set, get up, identify who all the players are, what they are, who they are, what they do. Um, it, that's all happening right now. And it's mostly uh, in, well, chapter 10 kind of warns this and lets us know, hey, uh, lets John know through uh, the angel letting John know that we'll get ready because you're not done prophesying yet. There's still more to come. And then chapter 11 um, is more of setting the scenes and, and identifying some of the players. Chapter 12, the same thing. Really, chapter 13 gets us acquainted with the Antichrist and some of the things he does, and then the, the false prophet in there. And then, uh, so there's, there's more parenthetical stuff. And then and then chapter 14, we'll kind of conclude with, okay, now I know you're wondering about the 144,000 because I told you, but here's where they're going to be at. And uh, here's what else those three angels with the woes, here's what else they're doing. And so there's a, a bunch of stuff that are parentheticals that are kind of mixed in. So I know, especially the first couple of times you look at it, it's, it's kind of like, whoo, I don't even know what I'm looking at here. So thus the handout. So you can look at it and um, we will um, have some discussion on it again in the future. But, um, so I want to go through um, the timeline a little bit here real quick. Do you have any questions about where we've been so far in the timeline? We had the um, all these parentheticals going on. We had that first woe in chapter 9 where we had those uh, beasties and the, the horde that looked like horses coming out after people. So we've discussed how the woes are... They're God's judgment, but these are of a, a demonic or satanic nature. So uh, we get into chapter 11. We're going to see more of that. Chapter 11 and chapter 12, these um, woes. And um, so then we've, after we get through here with the seventh trumpet, we start going into the bowls. The bowls, really the bowls, just to give you an example of what's going on and how these chapters we're in right now in chapter 12 and so forth with the fall of Satan getting kicked out by Michael and so forth. That's chapter 12. But really the bowls that are the, the great and terrible day of the Lord, um, they're not really recorded until we get into chapter 16. So all this stuff here has got a mix, a mishmash of bringing us up to date and getting this current and setting everything up for the great and terrible day of the Lord, the, the great tribulation. So that's what all that's about. And um, so stop me at any time if you need clarification. Um, go ahead and look over those charts if you like as we go. And um, 
But with that, this little red circle here is where we're going to are tonight. See that little red circle around the 11A? We're going to, that's where we're going to start off. That's not where we're going to stop, though, tonight. We're going to go ahead and, and um, we'll get as far as we can go uh, in this chapter. And I realize there might be some questions, so. Yeah, we ask a lot of questions, so we don't get very far. <laughs> you know, whatever it takes, if we have to finish up next week, then we'll do that. So let me do this. Um, let's see what I'm doing here. Poor computer is struggling here, and uh, I'm trying to get this thing to do what I want it to. All right, so go ahead and if you have your Bibles, and I'm sure you do, go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 11, and uh, let's kick this thing off. The way the, um, the chapter kicks off is with the temple. Now, I'm going to try to stick a pen in timing type of issues as we go, just for your consideration. For instance, uh, a lot of people will say that the two witnesses, their two witnesses are, are um, introduced to us in this chapter. So a lot of people will say, well, here we are in the middle of the book, and so um, it introduces the two witnesses. So the two, two witnesses start here in the middle of the week, and then they go all the way to the end, the end of the tribulation, right? All the way to the end of the Great Tribulation. Well, but then we have to ask ourselves, we start off right here with the temple. Does that mean that the temple starts right here now in the middle of the tribulation? So that doesn't really, that doesn't fit, does it? Not necessarily, it could, could already be there. He's just holding it up and measuring it. All right, yeah, exactly right, exactly right. Because it's got to be there before you can measure it. And it's got to be there before, and the sacrifices have to be going before the Antichrist can step in in the middle of the week, as Daniel chapter 9 says, to stop the sacrifices. So let's take a look at these. Let's unpack these and see some reasons why you know, how some of these things work and how they don't work. So I, I just want you thinking in those terms as we go, because I um, um, I, I think we're, we'll answer some of these questions as we go as well, but um, kind of have that in the back of your mind and, and make a mental note of what questions you want to ask in case um, we don't address them. Okay. So... Then I was given... A measuring rod like a staff and I was told rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there but do not measure the court outside the temple leave that out for it was given over to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months how long is 42 months mm -hmm. three and a half years exactly right now in case I don't want to assume anybody knows anything. We've already had this discussion, right, earlier this evening. So the, uh, the months in the uh, Hebrew calendars are um, 30 days. It's a lunar, lunar solar calendar, so it's a little bit different. It's like 360 days in their year. Um, every so many years, they have to met, juggle their calendar up, and we'll get into all those details, but it's very technical how to mathematically try to account for slippage between the lunar and the solar because it's we have here in the west pretty much strictly a solar calendar unless you're counting the month everything else is solar and the, and they very much are mixed and interlocked in the hebrew calendars but i digress so anyway so the numbering of the days just so you know how that works um and i will grant authority to my two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days. How long is that? 1260 days? Three and a half years. Still three and a half years, right? So it gives it to us in a couple of different terms here in this one chapter alone. So let me get this straight. Everywhere else in the Bible, if you ask a question, the answer is Jesus. If it's a time on it's three and a half years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, three and a half years. That's your go to plan B. <laughs> so. Now, the two witnesses, witnesses are used um, at times in, in uh, biblical history 
um, for a lot of things, but it's mostly for the glory, to give glory to God and to um, attest to his, his glory. And um, it's to record things and, and so forth and to attest. I mean, you're a witness. That's what it's about, uh, just like, as the term says. So remember with Yom Teruah, for instance, we're familiar with that with the Feast of Trumpets, what they would do when they wanted to verify um, the, the correct um, beginning of, the, of that feast, they would uh, send two witnesses up on um, a high point on top of the hill or, or the highest building or whatever it was. And later on, they grew and they moved into different cities, but they would have two witnesses. And whenever they um, would see and verify among themselves the um, first little sliver of new moon, then they would go down and they'd see the priest and they'd get it all certified and official and stamped and approved and all of that. And, and that would be uh, that would be what kicks it off. So we, that's another example of, of seeing two witnesses. So God is just following a pattern that he's begun long ago. So um, notice the temple is not in place for a specified amount of time. Um, in other words, it doesn't say that the temple, you know, like it's describing the two witnesses here, the two, two witnesses, what they're doing, 42 months, 1260 days, but it doesn't say anything like the temple is there for 1260 days. It doesn't say the temple is there for 1100 days or anything like that. To your point, Larry, it's um, what I think it was on the, um, the uh, temple website. There's a, an official website for the, for the temple. And they estimated that to get the temple up and built, it would be could be done within a, a year and a half, about 18 months. They said it could easily be thrown together. They, they pretty much have it all prefabbed and sitting in and warehoused and ready to go, and the cedar was out and curing and ready to go. And and I gotta assume the gold and things that they would overlay is all ready to go. They built all the implements. Um, they've Got an eye on uh, the whole red heifer situation. They've used genetics, DNA, to determine who's from what tribe. So they know who's of the tribe of Levi, and, and they're training them. They have no, several trained. Back in, the, I'm sorry, back in the 80s, I remember when... That was a big deal. First, um, no blemish, what do you call that? No blemish red cows born. And they were, they, were, they were just beside themselves because for so long they had not. And it was just one, and then there were two, and then there was nothing for a while. And then they, so they were starting from back in the 80s to um, the Roman Red Heifer. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible that we'll see at least the construction started on the temple. It's a good possibility. It's a good possibility. Yeah. A lot of people want to assume that this agreement that um, the Antichrist is supposed to step in and confirm includes the temple, and it could, but it could just simply be um, something he sets up with a peace agreement so that the surrounding Muslim territories will stop throwing rocks at them. When they built the temple back in Nehemiah's day, I mean, they're getting, they had to watch out for people, you know, uh, slinging arrows at them and everything else. So it. Yeah, so it could be that same type of a deal. You're right. So it could be, it's entirely possible. We just don't know. It would be exciting to see. It would be good to see. But that would be great confirmation right there. Um, so notice that we see the nations then trample Jerusalem for three and a half years. In my opinion, that that refers to the Great Tribulation because we see the we see the uh, from other passages like Daniel that when you get into the middle of the week, you see the abomination that makes desolate. We see the uh, the sacrifices stopped, and so we know that Israel, we know Jerusalem is going to be overrun. So I think that's referring to that uh, the Great Tribulation period um, that that uh, we've got coming up in our future here with these next few chapters. But, so, now, remember in the 90s AD when John wrote Revelation, 
Um, and one, again, one way we know not prior to 70 AD, as some people will try to say with the book of Revelation that it was written prior to 70 AD, Jesus describes the days in which um, Antiochus, my faithful martyr, who was killed among the church of Pergamos, that was Revelation 2.13. Um, Antip and, uh, Antipas, rather, was uh, martyred in 92 AD. So we know that Revelation was written sometime after 92 AD. Um, therefore, the temple that John knew had been gone for over 20 years at the time of this writing. So John is getting this vision here and told to measure a temple. So he's kind of saying, oh, okay, so it's going to come back. What's this? And it's going to look a little bit different than what he was measuring out. So there's John's perspective there, what he's walking into. Jesus in Matthew 24 and Paul writing in 2 Thessalonians 2 also focus on these temple events in the middle of the week. Um, as Gabriel described to Daniel in, in uh, Daniel 9, that is that time Jesus referred to as the time of great tribulation. And this chapter lays the groundwork for us with respect to the players and the setting of this final drama. So in Revelation 10, we had the angel probably Gabriel, he prepared John for the judgment of many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. So we know that the, uh, the time of judgment on the earth during the tribulation period is God judging the nations. All right, so um, in this illustration, this illustration shows um, a favored location among many modern Jews to build a new temple. So this is the most popular one. Many experts say it can be done within 18 months. Meanwhile, all the implements have been made uh, and are, are ready to go. So on the current Temple Mount location, how you'd see it situated over the Alcaz fountain, um, supposedly the drains and everything else work and it should fix it should fit with what they want to do the one of the phrases in here i want to call your mind to it, which it's a question not really an answer is rise and measure the temple of god and the altar um, and those who worship there the temple of god so the question comes up well is this really the temple of god or is it just the temple dedicated to god and the jews intended to be for god will god really um, honor that temple and bless it and so forth because here's the questions we know that the church the body of Christ is now the temple of God and, I, and the, a question that I get frequently from people is that well there can't be a temple because we're the temple now well yeah but the Jews don't know that and they're still looking for the Messiah well why do you Christians get all excited about a temple that's profane that shouldn't even well here's the deal Christians aren't excited about the temple for the temple's sake and because we're looking forward to seeing sacrifices happening because we know Jesus said to tell us that is finished. He is, he is the sacrificial lamb. He's the lamb of God. What we get excited about is temple means second coming is around the corner. That's what temple means. So when we see this, we know the end is near because of all these Bible verses that say this. The final, uh, the Antichrist, everything that happens there's got to be a temple in place. And until that happens, we're not there. But once that starts happening, oh my goodness, look how close we are. So that's where the excitement is. So um, some people need to just kind of chill a little bit and enjoy the ride. So there's the current temple plan, kind of a 3D model of what they, they made it look like. And then you can see it up there next to the Dome of the Rock Mosque. We've discussed this before that one of the things they were talking about that might be part of this peace plan thing is there has been discussion that Friday would be a time for the Islamists, the Muslims to worship and have access to the Temple Mount. What we call Saturday or the Sabbath for the Jews would be their time to have access to the Temple Mount. And for the Christians in the area, Sunday or Lord's Day would be their chance to have access to the Temple Mount. So that might be one way to try to to try to make peace among those groups. Again, I, everything indicates that this peace that we're that the Antichrist is supposed to bring is going to be kind of a false peace. I'm sure you know how they can twist 
and tweak um, the news media, right, and spin things a certain way. So I think it'll be a false peace. There might not be all-out war. Even that won't last very long. So here's a problem with that current Temple Mount location. Second Chronicles 3.1, it says, um, Then be Solomon began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David his father at the place that David had appointed on the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. So the threshing floor in the city of David is not on the Temple Mount, which is interesting. Now that doesn't mean that it doesn't spoil the plans as far as the book of Revelation is concerned with that temple going up there on the Temple Mount because that's not going to last very long and there will be earthquakes. It's going to be brought down. We know during the kingdom, Ezekiel's temple is going to be built by someone identified as Branch which we know is the Messiah, he himself is going to build Ezekiel's temple. We'll take a look at that. We've got a plan for it here. But Jesus said of the temple of his day in, in Luke 21.6 and in Matthew 24.2, he said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. So meantime, the, in the, at the Temple Mount, the so-called Temple Mount, it still has walls and it has pavers that are still in place. And the paving stones themselves are primarily what the Romans pried up at that time to get the melted gold from the temple in 70 AD. Because part of what they do with the cedar is they, and, and parts of the temple, they overlay it with gold. Well, they burned down the temple in 70 AD. The gold melted and ran down into the paving stones where the temple was located. And so the Romans, they pried up all those babies to get up the gold. So whatever that was at the Temple Mount was not, was not uh, the, uh, the temp proper temple location. Um, the city of David is more like about a quarter of a mile south of where the we see the uh, Temple Mount today. Uh, many experts will identify it as a compound for, for the Romans, um, a garrison for the Romans in that area, for um, Jerusalem. Um, there were places, for instance, other clues where, for instance, Paul, where Paul was in the temple or he was in that area and then he was carried up or walked up and he walked up to the garrison, the fortress up there on top. So that fortress would be where um, Paul had to walk up to it because the temple location is a little bit south. So what we see on the Temple Mount probably was that a Roman garrison. There's a lot of history behind it we won't go into. There's a really good book that I can recommend called Temple by Bob Cornuke, and it's an interesting read. And he goes into some of the history of how it got to be named as the uh, Temple Mount and some of the history behind that. So it's well worth the, worth the read. He, whether you agree or disagree with all of his conclusions, there are some things that are difficult to pass by, such as the Old Testament edict to build the temple in the city of David. And um, also Jesus' words about what will happen to the temple in the Temple Mount when it's destroyed and burned down. And that's not the case with the Temple Mount. So those are some key things to look at. Temple Mount, or uh, Temple Size Comparisons in the 70th, 70th week of uh, Daniel, or yeah, 70th week of Daniel. The Tribulation Temple, in other words, is not really described in this. It's not really described in the Bible. So you notice that, uh, John was given a measuring rod and told to go measure it, and he's told what not to measure, but there's no description of it. We don't even have the dimensions here, so it's not on this chart. This chart is available through Logos, through their software. And notice on the left the really big, huge one. Those are the dimensions described in Ezekiel. So the last eight chapters of Ezekiel are this large temple. 
Zechariah 6, 12 says, And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch, for he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Zechariah 6, 12. Therefore we know that this is not the same temple as we see in uh, Daniel's 70th week. And he, regarding Ezekiel's temple, yes, there will be sacrifices. For instance, if you, let's see, I think it's chapter, chapter 45. We see sacrifices there and, and how, it's, how they're supposed to be conducted. There is a prince who offers sacrifices. This prince, some people will say, I think it's Jesus, but it's not because this prince is described as having children and so forth. Um, some people think it might actually be David, that somehow David's going to be brought back and David will, will do all this. We have no way of knowing who this is. The scriptures don't say it. It's just pure speculation. So it's, it's not someone identified. So the tribulation temple, it's a key setting to confirm Jesus' words in the Olivet Discourse that the abomination that makes des desolate is yet to come and he will cause the sacrifices to cease in the middle of the week. Um, as spoken of by Gabriel to Daniel in uh, Daniel chapter 9. Again, this confirms 2 Thessalonians 2 as well. Do you remember what that was about? Bueller. I'm sorry, I was pitching. Ezekiel's temple is the one that's going to be later in the millennial, right? Yes. I'm sorry, I just can't read that. It's the millennial temple. Um, people about that people have issues with why would there be a temple why would there be a temple in the millennium and I understand that it's the same thing as why would God have a temple with sacrifices and so forth because he says well let me ask you this why did God have a temple in the Old Testament days before Christ before Messiah was the the shedding of blood of the animals did that affect any uh, washing away of sins um, or anything like that did that have any effect for believers then? What was the point of all the sacrifices? And Paul talked about it at great length in Romans, right? They're a shadow. They're a foreshadow, right? So you could say in some respects that, you know, people get all tangled up with the terms of a memorial temple. What's a memorial temple? Etc. Etc. We don't get wrapped up in that term. It just means it's a temple. The temple in the past didn't do anything to affect salvation or wash away sins any more than uh, this temple did. But it all points to the Lamb, the Lamb of God. It's a foreshadowing of Messiah, so people would understand what's going on when He's sacrificed. When you have the Passover Lamb, that people were told to take it bring it into the house for a few days, raise it, name it, let the kids play with it. And then when it came time to um, sacrifice the lamb, they had to take a knife and cut his throat. Horrific, awful, terrible thing to witness, to experience, to have to do, but that was the point. Because it's a horrific, terrible thing. It's the shedding of blood of something precious. Okay? And so... Same thing with Messiah, as you want people to understand that this is what the Messiah is doing for you. He's laying down his life for you, or the Father gives his son. So, yeah, it's pretty horrific. So it's to understand and appreciate what the process is and what is going on. And the same thing with, we've got mortals going into the millennial period, the kingdom age. We've got mortals going in. They're going to have children who don't know what this process is. They have to learn. So there'll be a temple there now. So if one can be a pre-memorial temple in the Old Testament, this is a post-memorial type of a temple. It all points to the Lamb. One points forward to the cross, one points backward to the cross. That's all it is. One's a foreshadow. You could call the other one, what, an aft shadow? But, you know, either way you look at it, it all points to the cross. And that's going to be the whole point of it. It is. is that, can I ask? I'm sorry. So yeah. it's, it's almost like with the Ezekiel's temple and the millennial, God has dispensations. So since it's the promises to Israel, he has 
Yes, he's no. bringing it full circle. He's bringing it full circle where this dispensation that he had in the Old Testament, he's bringing it forward. If they're going to rule, there's going to be a seat, there's going to be a temple, and we're going to do it all. Yeah, they're going to do it the right way now. Yeah. This is how it should have been done before. This is how the world should have been before, and it never got there. So now you're going to have all your promised land, and you're going to have your temple, and this is how it's, it's going to be. This time it's going to be Messiah sitting on David's throne and so forth. So it's going to be the complete fulfillment of all of those promises in every way. So, so, it's, the, and I'm just, so, we're, so it's the fulfillment of his promises to them from before. Yes. It's just he grafted in the church and he did all of that. And I was like, okay, here we go. We're going to do it. Okay. Yeah. So Second Thessalonians 2, again, about, about this the tribulation temple, though, is all about the um, false messiah, the antichrist, we call him, the man of sin, who stands in the temple and makes himself God, declares himself as God, and um, causes the sacrifices to cease and all that. So Jesus addressed that, talked about it as if it's yet future in Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse, and here Paul in Second Thessalonians does the same thing, talks about it as it's as though it's yet future. Questions about the temple? Probably a few more before we go into the two witnesses.